internet! Welcome to Apprentice Marks, my name's John. In this video, we're gonna be building a bookcase. Now, I gotta be honest with you, I've been putting this project off for a little while on account of I don't really know how to build a bookcase. I've never built anything quite that large before and I don't wanna fuck it up, but like most things in woodworking, a bookcase is simply a fancy box. We built boxes before, we can build a bookcase. Let's get started. All right, so let's look at the plan. I've got this three quarter inch ash plywood that I got from my local home store. It's uh, sanded both sides, which is really the reason I bought it. It's three quarter inches wide and it's sanded on both sides. Now, I mean, I'm painting this, but I'm still gonna have to do some sanding because the sanding that they do when they sell you plywood is, you know, it's like good enough you're not gonna get a splinter out of it, but it's not a finish sanding, but it will still save me some work. So it was worth buying and it was the only product that they had at the time. Here's what we're gonna build uh, effectively. We're gonna build uh, just a big box it's uh, 68 and a half inches tall, and it's uh, 28 inches across, um, and then it's gonna have five shelves. This sheet is too big for me to safely break down by myself on my table saw. So I'm gonna go at it with my circular saw here, sometimes also known as a skill saw. Although I think that's like a, like a Kleenex thing where skill is a brand um, and not actually the type of the saw, but regardless, that's how I'm gonna cut it. Now, this saw here, it has this plate that uh, will ride up against a fence if you want to make a nice straight cut. And this plate is about an inch and a half off of this blade here. So I want to make my cut on this pencil line and I want to cut straight across. And what I've done is I've set up this straight edge. This is just a, a piece of extruded aluminum. You can buy this for like uh, 20 bucks at, at any big box store. Um, and it's just a straight edge that you can set up and clamp in place with these little C clamps and you clamp it about an inch and a half off of the line that you actually want to cut. So when I ride this edge of the circular saw along this edge of my fence, I'm going to get a straight line that goes all the way across my wood. Now the entire cabinet is going to be affixed together with glue and screws. Um, before I bother trying to put the glue on these things, I figured I'd go around and affix it with screws to start. And then once I'm ready to actually put the cabinet together, I can back the screws out, put glue on the joints, and put the screws back in. And that way everything's guaranteed to line up properly. And it'll make it a lot easier to square everything up without the uh, wet glue causing things to slide around and such. Of all the jobs in the shop, I think sanding has got to be the worst. Luckily, I got a little bit of liquid encouragement to get me through it. But now it's done, so it's time to reassemble the bookcase. This time we're going to use glue so it's permanent. Okay, let's talk planning for a minute. This is what we built so far. You got your bookcase here, you got your five bays, three of the bays, the top one, the bottom one, and the middle one have cubbies, and the in-between bays here go the full distance across. There's gonna be a stand here of some kind, haven't decided how it's gonna look yet, that'll lift the entire cabinet up above our baseboard. We live in an older house, so we've got about an eight inch baseboard that we gotta get it up and over. Now. The next step is to build what goes behind these cubbies. So, think about it like this. I'm not gonna bother drawing in all the cubbies here, but if that's your bookcase, right about there, then on the back, there's a back panel that sits behind all the books that are in here. Now typically you just take like a thin piece of plywood or something, smack it back there and don't worry about it. But I wanna try and add a little bit of visual flair to this case by putting a little detail back there. So what I'd like to have is a bunch of lines back here, essentially, you see? That give you the idea that there's something going on back there without being too distracting or anything. I don't want it to be a crazy color or something stupid like that. And what I'm thinking of for those lines is kind of a tongue and groove look. So 
if you picture <clears throat> the profile of what those pieces on the back would look like from the top, right? They'd look something like this, but then in between pieces, be a little V-shaped notch like this. That's what I'm after. See? So that from the back, there's this little texture, this V-shape that kind of catches the eye if you look at it at a certain angle or something like that. <laughs> So here's the thing that's handy. I picked this up watching some YouTube videos somewhere. I forget which one. Need yourself a sanding block? Cool. Get a square of sandpaper, any grit will do. Piece of scrap wood, kind of rectangular shape, and a can of this stuff. This is a Super 77. It's a spray adhesive. You can usually find it at big hardware stores. Grab your spray 77, sandpaper, a little shot on the back. Watch the overspray though, this shit's sticky, it gets everywhere. Take a piece of scrap, set her on there, give it a second to chooch, roll the sides up. Kind of smells like new car smell, sort of. Stick it down. There you go. Give that thing a minute to set up. Sanding block. Custom size, any grit. It's a pretty cool trick. Try it out for yourself. Alright, so I've got the backing boards attached to the shelf and uh, they look pretty good to be honest. I think that a better approach to this would have been some sort of a shiplap type of piece, um, something that had like an overlapping thing between the seams of the backboards, but what I went with was actually just butting the backboards up against one another. So you probably can't see it in this shot, but if you look really closely in between the seams here, you'll see that there's you know a paper thin or, or like a half a paper thin slot between each seam. And I'm not super happy with that, to be honest. Um, it was an exercise to see if I could pull it off and uh, I think it looks okay and it'll look really good once it's painted up against a wall. But in the future, I think I would have opted for making those backing pieces a little bit more complicated. They would have taken more time to make, but I think I'd have got a better product altogether. Okay, so this diagram is the same as the previous diagram that we we're looking at, but these are the dimensions that you're going to have on the shelf once the one inch wide pine face trim has been applied, right? So remember we had the three quarter inch plywood box that we've already built, and then we're gonna add this one inch wide uh, by half inch thick pine facing on all of the plywood edges. And so when we do that, that's gonna result in shelf height and cubby widths of 12 and a half inches, and the internal width of a full shelf is gonna be 26 inches. Um, the outer dimensions, of course, remain the same because like I said, when we were planning the plywood box, um, the face trim stays flush to those outer edges and it just overhangs on the insides. These middle cubby dividers here, uh, I'm gonna try and equally um, divide the face trim. So when I put it on, the hope is that it'll overhang, you know, on the right side by an eighth of an inch and on the left side by an eighth of an inch. It'll be kind of centered, right? Um, and then, like I said previously, the, the face trim will overhang uh, from the shelf down uh, over the top of the shelf by a quarter of an inch and in off of the sides by a quarter of an inch. You'll see in a second. So with the outer frame on at the corners here, I've got this overhang. Um, I found in the past that uh, oftentimes trying to cut stuff exactly to the right length on the table saw can be troublesome. You'll undershoot or overshoot by 
you know, 32nd of an inch or something. And then you've got a problem on your hands. So what I've done is I've cut these long and then I'm gonna mark the appropriate length with a sharp knife here. I'm gonna use a chisel to cut a groove that comes up to that straight line that I've established. Just remove that material there. And what that gives me is a spot to put my saw blade to start. So I know that I'm gonna start at an exactly square corner in the right spot, and I'm not going to overshoot my mark at all. And once again, I'm making sure here that I'm cutting everything to the exact appropriate length. So now I can take this dovetail saw, set it in that line that I've established there, and then very slowly let the saw do the work. Nice clean corner that's the right length every time. checking in here. That's an awful mess. Uh, basically means that my paint job sucks. I was going to take this into the house, but it uh, looks like shit. So what I'm going to end up doing, I think, is I'm going to sand that down and I'm going to push it full of wood filler and then I'm going to sand it clean and do a fresh coat of paint. Yay. <laughs> So the way that the uh, paint turned out on the face frame of the bookcase really pissed me off and um, it's not the first time I've had trouble with masking tape leaving kind of a ragged ass edge. So I wanted to try something a little bit different, see if I could figure out a way to make the edge come out nice and clean. Um, so what I've set up here is a quick test bed. Um, I've got three pieces of plywood and I've just got some straight white paint on here. On this first one here I've got some blue masking tape that I used on the bookcase 
And then I've got the same blue masking tape and what I've done is sprayed some clear coat across here. I, I saw this on some video somewhere or other. I guess the idea is that the clear coat gets in where the paint would have leaked through and creates a solid line. And now when I put the paint over, we're gonna get a clean rip line, which would be interesting. And then I was uh, at the home center, I found this stuff. This is called frog tape. Um, I never tried it before. It's expensive. It's like 10 bucks for this thing. Um, but apparently it's got some kind of chemistry in it that causes it to bond perfectly with latex paint and allegedly create a very, very clean rip line. So I'm gonna put that on this last one here. And then I'm gonna put a coat of paint below each of these. We'll let it sit for 15, 20 minutes, get some tack to it. And then we're gonna pull them all off and see what gives us the cleanest line. So the paint's been on for about uh, five minutes and I'm already starting to see some interesting pattern here. Um, on this sample here where the masking tape is on dry, there's like a clear line where the paint stops and the tape starts and I suspect that that's where the paint's getting underneath the edge of the tape. Whereas on this one here with the clear coat you can definitely see where there's a layer of clear coat that the paint's sitting on top of because you can't really see the line of the tape so clearly. It's clear to me that um, the, the paint is going over top of the edge of the tape as opposed to getting underneath which is exactly what I want as long as it comes off clean good for me. This one's really weird though. This is the expensive frog tape stuff. And I don't know if you can see it on the video, but the edge is like expanding, bubbling up. Like, like this line, this edge between the tape and the board is getting thicker, almost like there's a, like, it, like it's puffing up um, in response either to the paint or, or to meeting the dry paint underneath it. So I'm really interested to see how that one turns out, but it definitely looks different. So I'm gonna give these uh, another 10 minutes or so just to tack up and then we'll try ripping them off and see what happens. Okay, paint's been drying for about 15 minutes. Let's see what the lines look like. All right, looking at the results, I gotta say the winner of the competition is far and away the blue masking tape with a shot of clear coat over it. Takes a little longer to apply, certainly, and I did notice that the clear coat kind of discolored the white paint underneath it, so you wanna make sure you don't get any overspray on it, but shit, that's a nice, clean line. That's beautiful. Whereas, just the masking tape alone has the same problem that I had on the shelf, uh, all kinds of jaggedy ass edges that are just unacceptable. The expensive frog tape, good, not great, but good. I'm, I'm impressed at it, honestly. It's still got some bleed, um, still kind of a jaggedy edge, but I gotta say, for my money, I think the clear coat is the way to go. So, I'm gonna take another shot at the face frame of the shelf. We're gonna use the clear coat method and see how it goes. Probably taking more time with this than I strictly need to. But seeing as we've already tried to get these lines right once and weren't happy with the results, I think it's worth investing in getting this masking right for round two. Because I'd be some pissed if we set this all up again and it still wasn't right. Finished up the paint job and I've let it sit and dry for a few minutes and now comes the moment of truth. We'll see if we got that straight line that we were after. Let's give it a go. Look at that perfect line. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Much more smooth. Far less jaggedy than the last attempt. That's really nice. So I gotta tell you, if you're doing something kind of finicky like this, where you really want that straight line, you gotta go with the combination of the masking tape and the clear coat. It's killer. 
So this is a finished bookshelf. It took my wife about eh, 15 minutes to fill it full of books. Frankly, I think it turned out pretty okay. Like I said at the top of this video, I was concerned about making a bookcase because I'd never made one before and it's a big project, but honestly, I think it turned out really, really well. It fits the space nicely um, and it solves kind of a storage problem that we, well, I mean, we're just gonna continue to have that as we continue to buy more and more books, but hey, whatever. For now, it's good enough. I'll make another bookcase in a future video. So that's it for this project. This is YouTube, so I've got to tell you to like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. Um, do that. That's important, I guess, or something. Um, in the meantime, if you want to see what I'm up to between projects, check me out over on Twitter. I'm at ApprenticeMarks. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you have a good one. Cheers.